remember seeing him read his, his Bible study lessons sitting at that same table. Those were great memories for me. I remember the life-saving advice he gave to us at that table. Come in or out. You're letting the air out. People would come in and they'd say, it's cold in here, Max. And he'd say, isn't it great? <laughs> it was a wonderful table and fond memories about that table. As I got a little older, I remember I was introduced to a new table, and it was, the, it was the table at my girlfriend's house, Julie, the same Julie that's here with me today. I remember her dad would come in, and, 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 and she's reminded me of this, but I remember it very vividly as, as they would hear him pull in the driveway. Barbara would say, Daddy's home. No one say anything until after he started eating. Yeah, men, sometimes we get home, we're cranky until we get that first bite of food in us. Danny would be that way a little time sometimes. But he would always sit there at the end of the table next to the microwave. That was an important part of food preparation, the microwave. And he could sit there and pull things out and set it on the table. And there was Danny and then, and then Barbara and Brandon. And Julie would sit by Barbara. And then I would sit on the other side of Brandon. And as the longer we dated, I eventually got upgraded. And I sat next to Danny we talk about the Bible. We talk about personal work. We talk about fishing and bow hunting and, well, any kind of hunting. He would talk about cars and, and doing mechanic work. And, and, and you, you, you enjoyed being at their table. And sometimes they would have people over from church and, and we'd have to set up more tables. But they weren't different tables. They were all an extension of the same table. Because the table is more than just a representation of, of where we get sustenance. It's more than just the vitamins and the nutrients we glean by eating at the table. A table represents friends and family and, and a concept of love. The table has long been a place of love and fellowship and it really began with God. This morning I want to turn our minds to God's table to spend some time looking at the fellowship of the table. And it begins with uh, Exodus chapter 25. Very in, early in the Bible, we see the table of God. In Exodus, the, the children of Israel are being drawn out of the land of Egypt. They had suffered for 430 years of slavery. But now, now they were going to have an opportunity of freedom. They were going to the promised land, the land which God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And now these generations later, they're finally going to get to go and be in that land. But on the way, God is establishing, or establishing them as a nation. We find Moses going to the top of Mount Sinai and there he receives the law from God. A law that was going to separate the children of Israel as a chosen nation. That he was God, they were God's people. And so God is going to not only give them a law, but he's establishing his presence with them. And during that time, he had them construct what we refer to today as the tabernacle or the tent and the idea was that it was a mobile home, that it could be carried with them and travel with them no matter where they might roam, no matter how far away they were. But during this time from Egypt to the promised land, which ends up being 40 years of wandering, God is with them all the way. And we know that because of the tabernacle, the holy place, and the most holy place. Inside the tabernacle, God had them build certain pieces of furniture. There wasn't a lot. An altar, an altar of, of incense. There was a, a lamp stand. Inside, beyond the veil, in the most holy place, was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. But outside, there was a table. In Exodus 25, he describes the building of that table. He tells them how wide it's going to be and how long. 
Tells them what kind of wood to make it out of. Make it out of acacia wood. And then he says, overlay it with pure gold. Years ago, when I was still at home, we, we bought this table from an antique store. We, we seemed like we always bought these antiques. And I remember it was a round table and it had a, a leather inlay on the top of the table. It was kind of interesting. But all the way around it, there was a border of two gold ropes intertwining with one another. And it was just gold leafing around that leather edge. I always thought that was pretty spectacular. Can you imagine walking in and seeing a table of pure gold? Overlaid with gold, every piece of it. You didn't see the wood that made up the underneath. You saw the gold. And then it says that there was gold molding around. They took solid gold banding. And it went all the way around the top of the table as a molding. And God said, make the, the bowls and the flagons for the drink offering. Make them of pure gold. And the plates and the dishes uh, uh, where you would place the, the bread and the incense. Uh, uh, make that of pure gold as well. And there's a certain symbolism to the opulence of this table. Uh, uh, no one had a table like this in their home. It didn't matter how rich you were. Even the kings didn't have a table like this. But when you walked into the, into the house of God, into this tabernacle, and you saw this table, you would say, that's the table of God. No one has a table like this. And then it goes on to tell that there was, there, there was a, the, the, we refer to it in the, in the King James says, the, the table of showbread. Or the table of the bread of presence. The word presence there in the, the Hebrew is a reference to uh, the face or being in front of the face of someone. And it's indicative if this is God's table, then God is meeting us at this table. But who was he meeting? There were 12 loaves of bread. And they represented a place for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. There was a loaf for Zebulun. There was a loaf for Dan. One for Gad. One for Asher. Everyone had a place at this table. Everyone was welcomed into the very presence of God. And the bread had to be continually baked and replaced because that aroma and that freshness of the bread was, was a representation of the very presence of God. As if God were saying to the children of Israel, come and be with me. Come here. The table of God eventually would be moved into the temple, the house of God that was more permanent. During those days, there was another table that became significant in the children of Israel. It was the table of the king. A king's table would have been an important part of Israel's life. And Saul, who was the first king of Israel, had a table. You know, when a king hosts a dinner, it's important to be there. And every, every month at the new moon, there was a, a dinner that Saul would host. In 1 Samuel 20, he conspires. I'm going to have David come and sit at my table. All the things that he's hated David for are now uh, uh, drawing up into crescendo and he is ready to kill David. When he comes and sits at my table, I'm going to have him killed. David gets wind of the plot. It's revealed to him. And he says to Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20 and verse 5, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. There's a phrase in, in the Bible, at table. Not at the table, but at table indicating that it's not about the, the framework of the table, but there is something special about gathering at table. He says, I should not fail to sit at table with the king, but instead let me go that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at evening. He's telling Jonathan this. Jonathan doesn't understand. My dad doesn't want to kill you. And David says, he does. I'm telling you, he really does. He's angry with me. When we came back from the battle with the Philistines and the, and the women were saying, you know, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. 
In that moment, the seed of hatred was, was planted in the heart of Saul. And he's telling Jonathan, that bush has grown and flourished. And he is ready to kill me even to this day. Jonathan tells him, your place will be empty and you will be missed. Three times, in fact, he says, you will be missed because your place will be empty. When we gather around that table and you're not there, people will notice. The king sits at tables with dignitaries and heads of states and VIPs. People didn't just come to the palace and say, I'm going to have dinner with the king. You had to be invited. You had to be background checked. You had to be screened. You had to be something useful to the king. Great conversation or entertainment or maybe a treaty was being formed or an alliance made. You had to be useful to the king. And Saul used this honor of sitting at the table as an opportunity for treachery and murder. His treachery could be seen even in in where he sat. The Bible takes the time to say in verse 25 that the king sat on his seat, sat in his place at the table. As at other times, he sat on the seat by the wall. Why would the king sit by the wall? Because his back is protected. When he's up against the wall, you can't get behind him. He only has to watch what's in front of him. And so he sat with his back against the wall knowing that there is treachery among people of the world, those who might come and dine with me. Why would he suspect them of treachery? I think it was because Saul himself was full of treachery. Because of his own personal untrustworthiness, he would project that untrustworthiness on others. And so he sat protected by the wall. Saul and Jonathan died eventually. And there was a new king. Still the king's table, but there was a new king. One of the first things we see David saying in 2 Samuel 9 and verse 1, as the new king is, is there anyone left? Of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. David was a completely different kind of king than Saul. David was one who was filled with compassion for people. And even though even though Saul had hated him so much and sought his death, David would often say, even to those who who claimed to to kill Saul, he put them to death for reaching their hand out against the Lord's anointed. That's how much love he had for Jonathan and respect he had for Saul. And so he says, is there anyone left of Saul's house that I may show them kindness out of respect for Jonathan? And there was found a child of Jonathan man by the name of Mephibosheth. During the, the time in which there was an uprising against the kings, uh, King Saul the, and, and, and the, the, the one who would try to be king after him, Mephibosheth, his nurse, fled away with him to hide him. And while they were running away, um, he, he hurt. He, he fell and was hurt. He was lame in both of his feet. Now, as, a, as an older man, or as a, a young man, I should say, uh, he's being told, uh, uh, you need to go to David. David wants to see you. And you can just imagine in his mind uh, what this must be, being invited to the king's table again. And when he gets there, he's brought before David. He's afraid. David says to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the lands of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Mephibosheth was was suspicious. After all, his grandfather used dinner at the table as a way of treachery against his enemies. What if David is doing the same thing? I mean, who's Mephibosheth? He is, he is a child of Jonathan, a direct descendant from King Saul. People, in, in, in this day and age, when, when a king's son or grandson was alive, they would often be the one crowned king. David is not of Saul's heritage, and so he had a right claim to the throne. 
And maybe David is bringing him in so he can kill him and take away the threat to his own kingdom. Mephibosheth asked, what? What am I? Who am I that you would consider such a, a dead dog as I? Dogs weren't well respected during this age. They were a nuisance. They were useless. He says, I'm even more useless than a dog. I'm a dead dog. Why, Why would you bring me in here? And David reassures him again. that I am going to show you respect out of my respect for King Saul and my love for your father, Jonathan. And 2 Samuel 9, verse 11 says, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He treated him with respect and concern and honor of anyone who was sitting at the table of the king. David would later write, about another table. In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of thine enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We we call this the, the great shepherd's psalm. Because God is depicted for us as the great shepherd. And we see these wonderful blessings that he, he leads us to pasture, feeding us, that he takes us by the quiet waters. There is safety and tranquility and, of course, the, the assuage of thirst itself. He maketh me lie down. He gives me the rest that my body needs. He takes care of every need that I could possibly have. And even when I am faced with death and I ought to be scared of my circumstance, God takes care of me. But notice, he says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How often are we beleaguered by anger, fear, distress, sorrow and what happens to our appetites don't they often go away even David when he is when he is sorrowful for his child that was born to Bathsheba that first one that is sick while he was alive here is David he is refusing to eat he can't eat a bite because he is so distressed over the loss of this child when the child finally dies and the distress is past of course he cleans himself up and and he begins to eat again. But how often are we, when we're angry or when we're sad and upset, do we just refuse to eat? Because we don't feel like it. And yet the peace of the great shepherd is, even when I'm faced with my enemies, those who seek my demise, those who hate me, he says, I'm at peace, and he prepares for me a table. My appetite is there because the shepherd brings me peace. We read of those opportunities of the table, the sitting at table with the shepherd, and we know, we know there is no fear in his presence. But we move then from the table of the shepherd to the table of fellowship by the New Testament the table fellowship became very important. Jews only invited certain people to their table, people that they wanted or people that they liked. To sit at table with someone was a sign of love and appreciation, even adoration for that person. For the Pharisees, for example, they, they only invited those that they felt were worthy to be at their table. 
The very name Pharisee means separated. They considered themselves separated from the infirmities and the imperfections of their community. They were the Pharisees. And only someone as perfect as they were could sit at their table. They did not want those who were physically imperfect, who were lame, who were blind, who were outcasts of society. They did not want those who were spiritually imperfect, the sinners, to come sit at their table. Theirs was the perfect table. It represented eating and dining with God. And so it was an important social statement to dine with someone or to sit at table with them or to invite them to your table. Luke actually develops this theme as a major theme in his entire book. He tells stories of Jesus eating with tax collectors in Luke chapter 5. He's, he's eating with a Pharisee and the, and the sinful woman comes and, and anoints his feet with oil in Luke chapter 7. He is eating without unwashed, or he's eating with unwashed hands in Luke chapter 11. He, he shares a meal with his disciples in Luke chapter 22. Luke even records several teachings of Jesus that center around being at table. He makes the great declaration in Luke 12, 37, Blessed are the ones uh, uh, whom the Lord finds watching, for they shall sit at table with the Lord. People, he says, will come from all over, east, west, north to south, to eat at the table in the kingdom of God, Luke 13, 29 tells the parable of the wedding feast in Luke 14. The parable of the, the great banquet in Luke 14. He tells the, the parable of the, the prodigal son who, who grew up at the table of the father and would eventually take his inheritance and go into a far country. And yet when he is, when he is welcomed back, the father says, kill the fatted, ca her fatted calf. Let's, let's get the table ready because we, our family is whole again. We can sit together again. The rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus who sat outside the rich man's gates, waiting for the crumbs from the rich man's table. The unworthy servant in Luke 17. Jesus even chooses to reveal himself on the road to Emmaus. He's walking with them and talking with them. He opens up the law and the prophets, or Moses and the prophets, and he's showing all of these prophecies concerning the Christ, and they have no idea who it is. But when they finally get there, they say, come in and eat with us. And he goes and he sits at table with them, and he takes the bread and he blesses it and their eyes were opened. And then Jesus is gone. Did our hearts not burn while he yet spoke with us while we were on the way? Time and time again, the table was a central focal point of Jesus' ministry in the book of Luke. And the point of Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes and the imperfect was to show that there was a place for everyone at his table. From the leader to the leper, there was always someone and always a place. Jesus wanted fellowship with every one of them. And the table of fellowship then to the table of the Lord. At the center of all of those tables, those families and that opportunity of love, there is the table of the Lord. First located in the upper room. When on the dark night, the darkest night in the history of humanity, Jesus himself gathered with his disciples for that last Passover supper as we saw last week. In the midst of that supper, Jesus took the bread and broke it and passed it to his disciples, explaining that it was his body given for them. Then he took the cup and he said, This cup that is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood, Luke twenty-two twenty. 20. Then he vows. 
Matthew 26, 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine in the tail of the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There is a table coming, he says, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to join with you and eat at the table again. And it would be in his Father's kingdom, in the church, And so each Lord's Day, we gather around his table. People come from all over, from the east to the west to the north to the south, just as he prophesied. Just as he spoke, they come from all over into his kingdom in order to eat at table with Jesus. And as unworthy as we are, Luke 17, we are marred by sinful pasts. We are embarrassed of what we have done. Our lives hold us back, slow us down, distract our hearts. And yet we come together from all of these different places and all of these different backgrounds. We come together and meet Jesus here at the table. The language may be different than it was in the first century. Cultures today may clash with one another, but the table, the supper... This is the same. It is the Lord's table. It's the shepherd's table of peace. It's the king's table of honor and respect. It is God's table where everyone has a place and everyone is welcome. It is the table of fellowship, communion with Christ, our God, our shepherd, our king, our Lord. And Jesus sits at table with everyone who is his. Every Christian. There is a place for every child. Peace from the loving shepherd and honor from the king. As we gather in the very presence of God. Tables are an important part of our lives. They remind us of love, fellowship, and family. From my grandpa's table to to our family's table today, we... There are special places for us to gather, to laugh, to pray, to eat, to study. But the table is set. God's table is set, and he has invited everyone. Look around. He's invited everyone here. Sadly, just like the parable of the great banquet While the table is prepared, there are many who have declined the invitation. Now is not a good time, they may say. Life is too distracting, or sin is too alluring, or righteousness is too demanding. But God, the gracious host, he holds out hope. There's still time. There's a place for you this morning. If you've never sat at table with the Lord, this morning he invites you. He calls to you. The invitation is already in your lap. May his offer of love and acceptance break down whatever reluctance that is holding you back. Take your place at God's table and respond to his invitation. Let him wash your sins away in the waters of baptism. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, and you want to meet him at his table in his kingdom this morning, repent of your sins and come to him and respond while we stand and while we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed?